what was the driving force behind you deciding I'm going to be a pelvic floor therapist? Yeah, right. So the fact that not a lot of people, including myself, know or know or knew about the pelvic floor therapy and how impactful it is for both men and women. Um, yeah, especially for women, but men as well. It's very it's a very uh, niche, I would say. So it's um, a very small group of us that go into it, but it should be a very bigger group of us because it affects both, everyone. Alexis. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> how are you doing? Good. How are you? Thank you so much for coming in today. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. So let's just get right to it. You wore a vagina costume on Halloween. Yes, I did. And I will wear it again any day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> what possessed you to wear a vagina costume? Lord? Yeah. So I'm a pelvic floor therapist, occupational therapist. Um, so I specialize in treating women and men who have pelvic floor dysfunctions. Um, I get into that. Uh, but essentially, the vagina is your pelvic floor if you have a vagina. Uh, but <laughs> both the men and women both have pelvic floor. Um, and they sit, the muscles sit at the bottom of us, like the L hammock that runs from the back of the tailbone to the front of the pubic bone in the pelvis. Um, and yeah, so vagina. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never get a better intro, McCookie. <laughs> Like ever. We could do this for another 20 years. It'll never get better than that. <laughs> ever. So I learned a little bit about this because obviously my wife, Jill, I'm very interested in the male pelvic floor thing going on. Because right away I think, well, women go to that, of course. I know. Yeah. But I hear men go to that. Yeah, absolutely. So, yes. Yeah, so both men and women have pelvic floor muscles and both men and women can have similar pelvic floor dysfunctions such as incontinence, whether that's uh, urine leakage or fecal leakage, um, any issues related to um, pain with sex. That can happen both men and women. Um, erectile dysfunction for men. Post um, hernia surgeries. I see a lot of men for that because that affects their pelvic floor. Um, any abdominal surgery, really, not just hernia surgery. Um, constipation, tailbone pain, a lot of nerve pain. So nerves that leave from the sacrum of the pelvis to the pelvic floor muscles. They can cause a lot of radiating pain into the penis, the testicles. Um, I see a lot of men with that. I see a lot of men for post-prostatectomies. So a lot of men who might have prostatitis, which is inflammation of their prostate, they or prostate cancer might have to get their prostate removed, which can then lead to a lot of the pelvic floor dysfunctions that I see. Um, but that can be a range from any range of from young to older. Um, a lot of older men will get the post-prostatectomies, but I have seen younger men who have prostatitis, and that affects them similarly where that inflammation um, creates a lot of tension around the bladder and the pelvic floor muscles. And so that can lead to some of the similar issues or um, just a lot of increased tension and pain in the pelvic floor. Um, I also see men and women for anything surrounding the pelvic floor muscles, such as like hip pain, back pain, uh, uh, all the things, pain-wise. <laughs> I, feel, I feel so inferior. <laughs> I, I must listen to the whole thing. I was like, holy Man. <laughs> it's what, a lot. What what was the driving force behind you deciding I'm going to be a pelvic floor therapist? Yeah, right. So the fact that not a lot of people, including myself, know or know or knew about the pelvic floor therapy and how impactful it is for both men and women. Um yeah, especially for women, but men as well. It's very it's a very uh, niche, I would say. So it's um, a very small group of us that go into it, but it should be a very bigger group of us because it affects both everyone. It affects everyone. So anyone can benefit from pelvic floor therapy just to learn a little bit more about these muscles and what they do uh, They do for us and um, their role specifically in stabilizing and supporting us. Um, and so I just saw the, the very strong need for it, especially especially in pregnancy and postpartum women. But once you dive into that, you see how it affects everyone. Um, and you learn so much more about the body that you, I would never would have learned before. So it just kind of sparked my interest and I just kept going into it and diving deeper into it. And now here we are. <laughs> wow, man. So, okay. 
<laughs> I'm trying to. How do you ask these questions? <laughs> ask I'm away. Like, hmm. <laughs> so, what? Okay, what could a, a a man do? I guess in his own free time or something, if he thinks something funky is happening. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, that's hard. It's it's a hard question, but answerable. So, a lot of the times, I feel that we tend to push our bodies to a limit and then that um, limit ends up leading to some of these dysfunctions that we don't talk about. So all of the things that I had mentioned are, are small, are, are big issues, but not a lot of us are talking about it. So um, some things to be mindful of would be like how you're exercising, if you're exercising, um, drinking enough water is a big thing so i feel like a lot of us don't drink a lot of water and that impacts our muscles very much so especially if we have prostatitis um or um incontinence in general a lot of it is from like a lot of more bladder irritants um such as coffee um, alcohol things like that so water intake would be something i would highlight um getting out there and just moving a little bit but being mindful of how you're moving so some heavy weight lifting um is maybe something you want to avoid or learn how to do so in a better way that would be protecting your pelvic floor muscles a little bit more um avoiding any like strenuous housework i feel like a lot of men do like like a lot of labor intensive things and well, that's like, what they do right? that's what they do that's yeah that's i mean a, a lot of men will do some like house intensive house housework um that can be very intensive on their pelvic floor and can lead to some of those problems so taking a look at like day-to-day -day activities what you're eating what you're drinking um what activities you're doing and just kind of like starting there and trying to be a little more mindful of it as far as like what to do exactly it's really hard to say because it's not a very generalized thing to do i work a lot on learning how to diaphragmatically breathe so our diaphragm, which is our main breathing muscle, a muscle that we, again, don't really think about or know too much about, if we can connect with our diaphragm in a full in the full way that it's meant to move, then we can at least start to connect our breathing with the movement of the pelvic floor muscles. So easier said than done, but that would be a great place to start and look into. <laughs> um, but again, it's, it's one of those things that sounds maybe easy, but it's not easy. So if there's any like inclination that there is something going on i i highly recommend just scheduling to see a pelvic floor therapist if that's me or anyone um i know there's not a ton out there so sadly but uh i would definitely just get checked out um even you know or bringing it up to your doctor for sure and seeing if they can you know refer you to somebody who is a pelvic floor therapist if they know of any others in the area um because i do get a lot of referrals from urologists or um just family doctors in general I feel like those are like the big two for men that I get referrals from. What do you say to guys that might be embarrassed? Like who wants to tell their wife, let alone a, a woman doctor, nothing I, I personal, know. but like, yeah, it's easier to talk to a dude. A hundred percent. Yeah. So like, so, Hey, Alexis, um, incontinent, like, you know, I know. So I feel like that's why I see not a lot of men because I feel like they won't come unless it becomes such an issue that it's impacting their daily activities and day to day and their quality of life. And at that point, it's almost like they will, they'll do anything in order to get treatment for it. So I highly encourage not getting to that point because there's a lot that you can do before you get to that point. And even if you, you, um, you know, bring it up to your doctor, because I feel like, you know, your doctor maybe would be of a male, um, you know, gender potentially. But uh, even if not, you know, a doctor is going to be there for you regardless of your gender. Um, I have it from both ends. So I think even just getting the word out, like it's way more common than you think. And a lot of times people think that they're alone in what they're dealing with. But a lot of the times it's very, it's way more common. It's just not something that we talk about. So just kind of even expressing that alone and having people hear that, like it's it's way more common, like you're not alone, I think sometimes puts people at ease. So um, yeah, I feel like usually I get men who have been referred by a doctor to start. So I feel like that's a great starting point. But Without that, even just bringing something up to your doctor to then get the referral to come to see me. Um, and yeah, sadly, there's not a lot of male pelvic floor therapists out there. I don't even, I don't think I know of any, to be honest, but. You think that would be like uh, acceptable? Yeah, I think so. From I mean, like, you know, like a female standpoint, because like, 
I'm not going to talk about it here, but Jill lets me know some of the things you have to do. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't know if like, uh, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. So I feel like there's male gynecologists and I feel like some women don't mind going to see a male gynecologist. And I feel like if you're comfortable with it, um, I think you could be comfortable with it. I think it's just, it's just whether or not you are comfortable with it. Right. But I think it's kind of similar to if you go to see a male gynecologist versus a female gynecologist. And there are male gynecologists. So um, I think it would be great to have a male pelvic floor therapist, even if it is just specializing in seeing men, because I think it would be a little bit more comforting. Um, but once, you know, you allow, you know, once you, once I at least bring somebody in, I, I do all the things I can do to make them feel as comfortable as I can um, and not make it weird. So I'll, I'll, I'll throw around like, all the words. You know, you like know. wearing a vagina costume. Exactly. It makes everyone comfortable. <laughs> Oh, man. How long have you, been, have you been doing this for? Yeah, so it's about almost three years since I started as an occupational therapist, and I actually went right into seeing pelvic floor um, therapy clients uh, almost right away. So within a couple of months of getting some training from another pelvic floor PT at the job I used to work at, um, and then kind of just going off on my own, taking courses on my own, um, and then starting to build like a caseload on my own. Um, so yeah, about three years now. Is it is it hard to get certified? Like how long does that take? So actually to be a pelvic floor therapist, you don't need a certification. You do, well, I, I shouldn't say that. You should for I like sure. Say, I can do one tomorrow. I can yeah, be right. Well, you do have to be, I should say that. You do have to be an occupational therapist, a pelvic floor therapist, I mean a, a physical therapist. Um, you can be different disciplines in the healthcare field and then go into the specialty. But to get certified, you actually need to have um, about over 2,000 hours of clinical mm. work under you. So you can't even go to sit for the exam for the certification without practicing first. Um, but I highly, I, I, there's no like need, but you should potentially take courses first or have mentorship or training from somebody who's been in pelvic floor therapy specialty. So I could take the exam if I wanted to, but I'll probably wait a little bit till I take the exam to be certified because um, it doesn't really do much either way. You just have a certification underneath you. Which, like a piece of paper? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it only lasts 10 years anyway, so you got to do it again. Uh, yeah, okay. I know. That's right how on. it. That's how it's established right now under the um, uh, Herman and Wallace Foundation, which is like the foundation for pelvic floor rehab providers. That's what they, spe- that's what they uh, title, title the certification. So there is a certification, but you don't have to be certified to start doing it. You just, you should, well, you have to be in the healthcare field and be able to, you know, license to do any internal kind of work. So. So were you always interested in helping out people? Like you always knew you were going to be like in some sort of medical field or. Yeah, pretty much. I pretty much knew from in college, I started um, in with a, getting my degree in psychology. So I thought I wanted to go down that route to start with. Um, and then as I was in my undergrad, I um, kind of saw more of the healthcare world. So I worked at like a physical therapy clinic where they had occupational therapy and a physical therapist. Um, so I saw a little bit of both and I saw the great the greatness of both. But I chose occupational therapy because I felt it was a little bit more geared towards um, people's like daily living um, activities of daily living, helping them really, you know, improve quality of life, their, what what they do day to day versus just strictly focusing on the physical aspects of somebody's life. So helping people change even like some lifestyle habits and routines. That's what occupational therapists are tr- more trained in. So they do get a little bit of, of both the mental health piece, um, the social aspect piece, um, your physical aspect piece. So you get a little bit training of all parts of a person versus just strictly looking at somebody anatomically. So that to me is the biggest difference between PT versus OT. But both PTs and OT specialize in pelvic floor therapy and can certainly look at somebody as a whole person. Um, but it's our under like um, our background training that we're trained in a little differently. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> I just build websites, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> and you do a phenomenal job oh, at that thanks. because there is no way I could do anything like that. <laughs> There's no way I'm touching any public floors either. Yeah. <laughs> so going back and forth. That's fair. <laughs> so you, you, you dug psychology. Yeah. So why did you veer off the path? Was it like too heavy or? Yeah, I felt, I felt again, it, it just wasn't 
getting, I felt like I wasn't getting like the whole person actually, because I feel like there's so many parts of a person and to try to help a whole person, you have to look at more than even just the mental health piece, not to take away from any mental health therapist or psychiatrist or anything like that. Um, I just felt like I could be doing maybe a little more. So that's me doing a little more. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But it definitely helped your, my background because I feel like a person is a person and psychology is the study of people. So it helped a lot to kind of look at somebody. Yeah. I bet because you probably have training in speaking with those people that might be a little quote unquote difficult during the process. Yeah. They're definitely, you know, not, not everyone's just, you know, hey. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Hey. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, you just learn how to talk to people, I feel, or, you know, it teaches you to, yeah, look at somebody or figure out ways to kind of um, have somebody open up to you and, yeah, make them feel comfortable. Oh, no. Are you so. from here originally? No, I'm from New Jersey originally. Um, Jersey. Yeah, Jersey. What's up? Yeah. So, yeah, I was, I grew up in New Jersey. Um, I went to my, all my schooling was in Jersey. And I had met my boyfriend who lives here in Berks County um, in grad school. And so that's how I ended up coming here. Oh, so you yeah. came over here for my man, Alex. Yeah, that's it. Oh. Yep, Alex. Yep. So uh, sports, sports teams? Oof. Sports teams. Do you even watch sports? Do you care? Uh, you know, it's not the thing I follow, but I'll watch them. Because <laughs> well, you're from Jersey, so I'm interested now. I oh, know. Like... So my whole family, if they were to hear me say that I am anything but a Giants fan, they would be very upset. So I'm 100% a Giants fan. Uh, but being here now, I'm also a Phillies fan of any sorts yeah. because I yeah. feel like I have to be. But <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Personally, I don't care either way. <laughs> yeah, I'm a Giants fan. Oh, nice. See, yeah, there yeah, you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Giants fan, Mets fan. That's so great. I'm just glad you didn't say Yankees fan. Oh, like, God, no. No, please. I baseball is so not my thing. So uh, well, we can <laughs> that I don't follow. Around. We don't have to go down that road. Yeah. Break my heart. <laughs> Did you have any other dreams as a kid? Like, you know, obviously we're all kids and we're growing up. And, you know, I thought about being a baseball player and a pilot. You know, did you ever think about doing anything else other than helping people? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, that's a good question. I definitely wanted to be a teacher for a while. I started with that. And then I wanted to definitely go into nursing. My aunt was a nurse, so I always looked up to her thinking I was for sure going to go into nursing. Um, I feel like those were my two things that I thought I was going to go into. It sounds like you always wanted to help people. Yeah, I think so. I, I guess so. Yeah. yeah. What do you think that stems from? <laughs> yeah. Like, is it something like, uh, I mean, your aunt was a nurse. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. My grandmother, I, I looked up to a lot growing up, and she was just somebody who gave her, like, her shirt off her back for anyone that walked into the door or anywhere. So I think I grew up around her that she was that person. So... I think that had a lot of influence in, mm -hmm. um, she was actually um, like part, partly my teacher, I guess you could say. She did some like preschool teaching, Greek school teaching with me. So um, I might have like started down that route, just kind of looking up to Greek her. Greek school teaching. Yeah, Greek school teaching. Is it a lot yeah. like that movie? Yeah, my big, the fat, big Greek fat Greek, Greek wedding. wedding. It, I freaking a love very that similar. Movie. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite movies. Very similar. Um, we don't. I don't have a very big Greek family. That's uh, like all the Nicks like we don't have that many but <laughs> we did have one Nick for sure <laughs> is, it, is it both your parents Greek or yeah both my parents yeah my mom and my dad um and yeah their family so I'm mostly Greek and then a little bit of German that's what oh, I grew up being like yeah cool. yeah so it was like all the uh like so you don't have a lot of Nicks but were the family similar to the one in the movie yeah yeah just kind of loud and uh <laughs> and uh very very uh Hoppa. yeah exactly <laughs> Very strong Greek women we have in our family. That's, so, I, mean, <laughs> That's I, what I, I say. I freaking dig that movie. I dig the whole vibe behind that movie. I know the dad used to live here. Uh, oh, he was from really? Reading. Oh, yeah. yeah, I didn't know that. I yeah. ran into him with my daughter one day at Barnes and Noble. No way! I wow, I would have loved that. Oh, dude, I looked at him. I was like, <laughs> I love your work. I love that. I was like, but I love you know, I love big fat Greek weddings. Yeah. Like, Thank you. He's very cool. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, I didn't want to bust on him or bother him too much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was like, put oh. some Windex on it. You know? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, man. Yeah, yeah. No, I dig it. That's awesome. I mean, I love being from. You know, I feel like the, the being from big families like that are like uh, are um, 
big personalities. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I love that with uh, my side of the family. Like, uh, you know, my dad's Spanish. He's from Ecuador. So his, yes. his family's just like, you know, we're pretty loud too. Like yes. when I was younger, when we all still got together and it was like, a million kids running around and all the aunts and uncles and stuff. So yes. it's just two different languages, but it's the same shit. It's the same. Exactly. We're, right. Just bigger family. Yeah. yeah we'll do that. It's a good time. Yeah. It's a good time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so what do you think um, your next move is going to be? Like, you know, I know you're at Core Health. We, everybody, yeah. you know, we love Core Health. We love Jason Sarah, of course. I know you've been there for a minute since the old place. Yeah. You know, what are your plans? What are some of your goals? Yeah, that's a great question. I I feel like um, I think growing pelvic floor therapy in general, I've done some talks here and there. I've done some clinics at some gyms here and there. Um, I've talked to some students, occupational therapy students. So getting into more of that where I'm just kind of doing more spreading of the word to try to get more people um, uh, to just get the word out there about pelvic floor therapy, hopefully growing the pelvic floor therapy Um world at core health i think would be like one of my next goals um and trying to make that a bigger a bigger thing there because i feel like it is so needed um and there really needs to be a little bit like more pelvic floor therapist um we just hired another pelvic floor therapist Mm -hmm. marley so she's starting um and getting her training in and starting on her own which is awesome so it kind of uh alleviated some of that wait waiting period to get in to for, for to see me for pelvic floor therapy so even with her, I think getting even more therapists on board, um, whether that's PT or OT, just getting more um, on board. That would be my next goal and just getting the word out more about it. Yeah. So Marley, did, did she go through some uh, training before she met you or has it started with you? So she ha- she did. She's just finished OT school. So she got that training done. She did take one of the courses um, that you really should take before starting public floor therapy um and then now she's been training with me for over a month and has been even coming to some sessions before her, she really started um so she's gotten some good training under her belt and now she's continually training by now doing her own thing but also with me you know helping her out if she needs um and being there to kind of guide her if, if that's part of what she might need so, yeah, she definitely is. She's ready. She's definitely ready. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. That's great news to hear. Yeah, yeah cause I definitely. know you were like, I don't even know anybody else around here other than you. Yeah, I don't know many. Um, I don't know anyone personally. I've heard some people here and there, but I don't know of many as well. So, and if there's more, hopefully we can all join together. <laughs> <laughs> so, if somebody thinks they have an issue, or should I, well, I know you spoke about all the issues in the beginning, but. You know, what are like, what are like maybe the top two or three things that you notice either men or women um, that they may be ignoring that they should probably go see a pelvic floor therapist for? Yeah. A lot of things. Um, I think any general, general pain head to toe. I think you should be seeing somebody to help you out with that um, because pain is not normal. So there is that underlying like idea that we all kind of think just having you know any type of pain whether it's back pain neck pain well, any pain is just kind of like part of life but um it doesn't have to be so learning that that alone is not like a thing so you should see somebody for that um specifically pelvic floor would include if you're having any sort of leakage any amount from like small to a lot that is not normal common but not normal um any any issues with going to the bath, like having bowel movements, any constipation or having more loose stools, that's not a, um, a normal thing. So seeking out help there. Um, a lot of the things that we just normalize that aren't actually normal. So pain, pooping, peeing, pain with sex, not normal. Yeah. Four P's. Yeah. The four P's. Exactly. The four P's. If you got pain, any of the four pooping, P's. Pooping, peeing, yeah. pain during sex. Exactly. Yeah. I would say those are the top things that I would highly recommend not um, just kind of continuing doing because it's not yeah. normal. Yeah. And there's help yeah. out there. Yeah. I know. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, if you feel like you have one of the four P's, yeah. definitely check out <laughs> my girl Alexis over at Core Health. She's going to help you out yeah. for sure. Uh, Alexis, thank you for coming in today. I, I felt, I mean, of course, I'm always looking forward to seeing you and learning about you, but I feel like the 
I was very interested in pelvic floor. It's one of the only things I think I really talked to Jill about when she says like a man, a man came in for therapy. I'm like, whoa, what was that like? Because yeah. I'm intrigued. I know. You know, and, and I'm in a fortunate position where I can just ask Jill, you know, and she can tell me what Alexis says or what right. Alexis does. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So, you oh. know, I love that. But I was just very intrigued and I just wanted to yeah. just sit down and talk to you, see what's up. I love that. I think if you wanted to know even more like a typical session, if you wanted to know what that looks like, it would be like your first session where um, you come in, we just chat. Honestly, we just talk. We just talk about the things, the four Ps, you know, <laughs> see how that's all going. <laughs> uh, we talk about your history, any medical history. I think um, another thing is like people's medical histories or past injuries really do impact their bodies more than they think or know. So that's important to know about um, and take a look at. Um, I'll take a look at you just kind of externally. So we'll do like a head to toe assessment where I'm looking at your posture, range of motion, some of your functional movements, like a squat. I'm looking at your breathing for sure, um, seeing how that's looking. And that that pretty much takes up our first session. If any internal work is needed, we talk about that at the first session. It doesn't have to be done in that first session. It doesn't have to be done, period, at all. Um, there's a lot of great benefit to internal work, and I'll explain all of those benefits to the person. Uh, but you don't have to. You don't have to do it if you don't feel comfortable, or if you just don't feel comfortable yet. That's totally fine and cool. Um, so no one fear that that has to happen because it doesn't. And um, our second and third sessions will look a lot more like maybe there's some hands-on techniques that I might do um, to loosen up maybe some fascial restriction that there is in a lot everyone's body somewhere. So maybe that's part of it. Um, we'll definitely be doing exercises of some sort. Um, more functional training I like to incorporate more of. So things that you can easily do day to day. That is changing your your whether it's your posture or your pelvic alignment, um, things like that that are more easily accomplishable than just you know setting time aside to do five exercises. Maybe that's part of somebody's root the somebody's treatment plan, but not everyone. Um, and it kind of just depends on the person what they're already doing. And I try to just make a little bit of change in their day to day that doesn't impact like it's not a, a big change all at one time. So that's where I might see somebody for a longer period of time. But that's because change takes time. So um, building habits and routines, that's going to take time. Right. So I need to see somebody for a, a period of time to kind of achieve um, that change. So but it, it's all small baby steps along the way. So. Um, yeah, a lot of talking, a lot of things that you do day to day and, you know, learning about the person, I think it's just part of it. Um, and yeah, just kind of starting there. So yeah. 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 So All yeah, right. just that. <laughs> all right. Alexis, thank you so much for coming in yeah, today. Thank you so much for having I me. I could it. talk about this all day long. I so know. I I, know. <laughs> I'm just like, whoa, there's so much to be learned about. So this. much. Yeah. It's, it's okay. a lot, but it's good. It's all good stuff. Yeah. yeah. Dude, Core Health is so lucky to have you. Berks County's lucky to have you. Oh, well, I'm lucky and to be at Core Health because right they're awesome. Right yeah. On. And it's just, you know, it's, it's also just, you know, a testament to your character. You know, like people love you. You do a great job. And, when you, you're around good people, everybody else is uh, cooler as well. So kudos. That's right. Well, I, got, I got a lot of cool people around me, yeah, so that's dude. good. <laughs> All right, I'll say hello to my boy Alex for me. I will. Yes, I will. Right, talk to you soon. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> Hey, thank you for checking out this episode of Fret Talk. If you dug what you saw, make sure you like and subscribe so you never miss another episode. You can also check us out online at frettalk.tv. Don't forget, your Uncle Freddy loves you. Peace. Oh, 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 oh,